Hey everyone out there, Dan here, aka The Comic Concierge, and this is part two of my Ed Brubaker career retrospective where I'm going through all of his major works to give you my thoughts and opinions on those books and seeing how much his career evolved throughout the years. Uh, this week we're actually going to be talking about two books, the first being An Accidental Death. This was in three issues of Dark Horse Presents, it was kind of a, a short story, uh, and the second being At the Seams. Um, this is actually written and drawn by Ed Brubaker. Um, this was just a one-shot issue with short stories inside of it. This is much more akin to low life in its design, again, both by the fact that it is uh, a story that is written and drawn by Ed Brubaker, but also because it is kind of dealing with similar stories to that of low life. But first, we're going to talk about his work in Dark Horse Presents. And this is the first comic we'll be talking about that is not written and drawn by Ed Brubaker. This is actually drawn by Eric Sh Showar. And they both have kind of a unique situation where they grew up in the same town, kind of, in the sense of they both grew up in, in Gitmo, in Guantanamo Bay, the army base uh, in Cuba, which is kind of weird, which, of course, has gained a lot of notoriety in since the war in Iraq. But, you know, they lived there prior to that, really in, in the late 70s, early 80s. And this story, An Accidental Death, takes place entirely there. And it's about this kid, Charlie and Frank, who are friends, who are teenagers, just trying to live a life in a really isolated, unique world where a lot of weird things happen. And of course, with a title like An Accidental Death, you're assuming some sort of death happens. And that's the case. And I guess I'm going to kind of spoil it, but this is the entire premise of the book. So there you go. Uh, Charlie and Frankie are both are both sons of military individuals. Charlie's father is nearly never there because he's always deployed someplace else where Frankie, his dad, is kind of the pseudo, not mayor, but kind of helps run the base. So he's always there. Uh, Frankie, there's, there seems to be an, a strange relationship with he and his father, but also there seems to be maybe something a little bit off about him. What happens is a, a new individual, new family moves in into the into the base. And as they're kind of going to check out the family, because the mom is a little person and they're kind of admired by that. They think it's the weirdest thing ever seeing the mom being a little person and the rest of the family is bigger and kind of mocking them in the way, you know, they're not the greatest people in the world. But in the process of that, they kind of run into their daughter's bedroom, who's around their age. She's like probably, you know, a teenager as well, same grade level, and she's undressing. And Frankie is completely admired by it. He kind of is absorbing that moment and then kind of becomes infatuated with this girl. And it becomes his complete focus. And then flash forward, Frankie comes up to Charlie, kind of covered in blood. And what has happened is that she's now been killed. Why has that happened? She's seeing it was an accident. Maybe they got in a little argument, whatever, whatever happened, she's now dead. And he's reaching out to Charlie to see if she, if he can help him, will he help him? And they both dispose of the body. And then kind of the story is them kind of dealing with that guilt and trying not to get caught and trying to kind of avoid detection because everyone's looking for this missing girl in a very isolated area. Obviously get, get most not very large. It's a very small town. If you even want to call it a town, so the, the pressure is really on, especially the fact when it's, you know, Frankie's dad is the person that's really doing the investigation behind what really happened. One of the things that obviously stands out most is the fact of, of the location of this. And it's kind of weird that somehow it was serendipitous that both Eric Schoer and both Ed Brubaker grew up in this town and were able to tell a story that takes place there. And looking back at the last week's story, Low Life, which was Ed Brubaker kind of doing a semi-autobiographical story about things that happened to him as a you know kid, as someone growing up. Now we're having another story. Of course, this isn't necessarily a, a one would assume based upon true life events, but still kind of tied to his things in his past, kind of tied to kind of where he grew up. So see, it seems that he's like kind of settling into that in a way, having that linchpin of reality to try to add that to his stories. And probably was a, a good way to kind of build a relationship with his artist as well, knowing they're coming from a very similar place. You also see that uh, the art here is phenomenal. It's again, black and white. This is back in the day when a lot of any comics were, you know, it was, you know, color was expensive. So they went that route. But even with that, the, the, the cartooning here is really strong. You know, you can definitely see, you know, where Ed Brubaker is a pretty strong cartoonist. He can do his job, as we'll get into with the next comic. He's nowhere near that level. He does not have the, the nearly the, the detail in his art and the ability to kind of capture the moment. It's it's next level, for example. Brubaker is functional in what he does as an artist, 
Uh, but clearly, you know, this is probably where you saw when it came to his artistic style with some of the other artists. He wasn't quite there. Um, not that his art was bad per se, but wasn't nearly as dynamic as what we get on the page here. And that's really, I think, why this book probably got the notoriety that it did. It was nominated for Eisner's and in and, and large part. Again, all these books help put Ed Brubaker on the map, but this was another really big one. Not the last time they'll be working together. In fact, next week we'll talk about the, the Prez one shot that they worked on from DC, which was actually Ed Brubaker's first work uh, for DC at, at the time. But the thing is the art is probably why this book got the notoriety it did. If you look at the story itself, it's, it's fine. It, it's effective with what it's doing. It definitely shows how an individual can get caught up in something that they never thought they'd be caught up with. You know, this kid probably never thought he'd be hiding a dead body, but... You'll do a lot to help protect your friends, especially when you're in the moment. And again, I do wonder if that's going back to Edward Baker and the fact that he's kind of done some things he's not proud of earlier in his life and thinking like trying to relive that guilt in some way, going through that situation, trying to kind of put, put a character in that perspective where they're doing a bad thing, but maybe for the right reason in a, in a twisted sense. Really, I think it was a, it was well told, like you understood who these characters were. I think the sense of place is probably one of the strongest aspects of it. Just the location of it makes it unique. The fact that it is, you know, in Gitmo, like it, it being a short story, it probably would make up if you put it all together, like one general comic book issue. And this was the first issue that was, and of course it made the cover on that issue. This was issue 65 of Dark Horse Presents. The, the sad part is these are hard to find digitally. Like I, I couldn't find them digitally. The only way I was able to buy this was getting it off of eBay. The good thing is it's, it's really cheap. I think I purchased it for like this entire set for $15, maybe a little less. And this is issue number 66, which is part two. Again, this is when it's like in the middle of the story. This was only in the cover for the first issue. And then the last issue, uh, this was actually a super issue, uh, 67. This was the last it was the the last part of the story wasn't here um, of course this is not where ed brubaker was ed brubaker so they're not going to put him in, in, in every cover but i do think this cover right here is pretty striking just again you get a sense of what the art looks like here of course it's being colored that that red is is you know one that is going to jumps off the page with the other muted colors and i do wonder what the colors would have looked like if it did, they did go that route Next week, when we talk about Prez, you will see that. And kind of, there are some techniques here that I think we see Ed Brubaker use a lot, especially in his career now. And the first being cold opens. He's really strong at utilizing cold open, push, putting you at the end of the story first before we get into the actual beginning of the story. And this story opens up and we actually see Charlie in a completely different time and place in his life. He's a lot older. Um, his hairstyle is different, but he sees someone that is just making him feel guilty that he's looking at her in the sense of, does she know? He, you, you see that he's just scared by her presence. You don't know why. And that's how it opens up. And then we get the flashback into what actually occurred. And you also, I think, I think fathership and, and dealing with fatherhood is a part of this as well, or the lack of fatherhood. As I mentioned, you know, Charlie, his father isn't there, not necessarily by choice. His father is just always deployed where we have Frank and his father is there, but they clearly have an estranged relationship. It doesn't go into a lot of detail, but just when they're around each other, you see that Frank's father is really hard on him. It seems almost to despise Frank for whatever reason. Maybe he's not turning out the person he wants. And that really comes to a head as the story unfolds near the end and just seeing the decisions that, that were made, things that you would never think of a father and son would, would go through. And it's, it's really harsh and, and kind of brutal to read in that sense. And again, two comics into this retrospective and Brew Baker certainly likes to get into kind of the horribleness of humanity in, in a lot of ways, the, the skeeviness in a way, like these are kind of showing the warts of the way people act and the, the oddity of relationships, you know, whether it be, you know, more of a romantic relationship or in here with parenthood. So I'll be looking to see if that is something that is kind of continuous with the books we'll talk about. And the, you know, looking at kind of the underbelly in the, the failures of, of us to connect as individuals and then the residuals of those failures and what it can lead to. And here, it leads to a murder. What's also kind of interesting so far with Ed Brubaker's work is that a lot of his narratives ask questions, but don't necessarily try to solve it or get into the sense of they don't know what the right answer is in the sense of, you know, why exactly did this happen? Does it doesn't necessarily have a meaning? Was there a way to stop it? I think there's those questions are asked, but I don't think necessarily their exact answers. Well, life again, I thought that happened a lot with the relationships as well, in the sense of the brokenness of them, and and in the way that people would kind of break each other's heart, but ask questions of is that just the way that we are as human beings? Should we stop putting so much 
onus on what people expect from us when it comes to relationships. It generally just seems like Edward Pick is working through some stuff with his early work. Again, a lot of it's relating back to his, his upbringing, his past life. So it makes sense. I think it is almost like a thera therapeutic exercise, which art often is. When you look at the general quality of this story, like where does it rate? I think it's a pretty good story. It's definitely not Ed Brubaker at his best. Again, you know, this is one of his second major works. This was Eisner nominated. Uh, so I, I'm going with the perspective of knowing what Ed Brubaker is becoming to what he is here. And uh, clearly he's not you know, the, the veteran or the, the best writer in comics that he would eventually become, or at least one of the best writers. A lot of the signs are here early on. Like, this is not a, a bad story. This is, again, another impressive debut for someone just trying to find his voice within the comic book medium. Again, but I think really the selling point for this specific issue was the art. That was the strongest aspect of it. Uh, and you could kind of see why he would choose to work with this artist again, because it brings a lot to the page. Let's get into the next book we'll be talking about, which is at the seams um this is again another book that's a bit harder to find it's not available digitally at least i couldn't find it um it's not collected in anything but you can find them for pretty cheap on ebay i got this for like six bucks on ebay i don't know how many were printed at the time this comes from alternative comics i got this i thought this was supposed to be the first issue of a series but it's not this is designed to be a one shot as i mentioned there's three stories in here the first being under a black sun and I mentioned like with the last book, how it seems like it's a brief breaker working through some things. And I think, again, that that's the case here. And the first story thing asks the question about do, do things necessarily happen for a reason? Is there a reason behind things or is are things just chaos under the black sun? So why it's called that is because in this story, the sun turns black and you wonder, like, why is that? You know, what is it getting into some sort of science fiction with that? And really, it's just a thing that happens within the story, but it does set off kind of a series of events where things kind of break down. It's always about the, the main character, who I don't think is ever named, and he, he's living with his girlfriend, June, and, and their friend, Paul, lives next door, and everything's going pretty well. He seems to really have a pretty happy life. Then the sun turns black, and things start to kind of go astray. June ends up moving out because it breaks, breaks up with him. He She moves in to live with, um, with Paul, in the meantime, as she kind of gets her life together, but soon he realizes that there's actually infatuation and that they're actually dating. There's clearly more than friendship, which I'll obviously, you know, calls him to kind of fall in despair and ask that idea of like, is this chaos? What's the reason behind this? What, what caused this to happen? What did he do? Did he do anything? Was it his failure? Like, why aren't things working out? And I think he's struggling with like, sometimes just things don't work out. Sometimes it's not necessarily someone's fault. Um, and you see that him just trying to kind of also stay having a relationship with Paul. Like they have this weird conversation at the bar talking about one of their, their old, their old uh, shop teachers. And it's just this awkwardness, but they're just trying to move through it thinking, you know, we're all, we're all just people. And that, that's actually a phrase that's repeated throughout the series, which actually flashes back to low life because that was another line that was in that book. So kind of utilizing that. So you, you see him that we're all just people line kind of repeated in his work already. So I, I do wonder, again, is that coming from another personal place? And that, you know, not to spoil the story, but the story gets darker and darker near the end. And again, I think it just, it gets into the idea of do things happen for a reason or do things just happen? The reason behind the chaos, it's asking that question. And I don't necessarily think it's fully answering it because I don't think it knows the answer. When I say it, but I mean Ed Brubaker, of course. Yeah. The second story, again, you have another story dealing with relationship drama. Uh, this I thought was really effective in the way it opened. So it opens up and you see this character running after this other character and you don't know why. You just, they're just running after each other. He's clearly angry. He's trying to get him. Eventually he gives up and walks back into his house with what you suppose is his girlfriend, the way they're interacting with each other. But then you see him look out. And at first it, it took me a second to realize what was going on because he sees his girlfriend making out with that guy he was chasing on the couch. And you know that girlfriend that was also behind him. Second, I was considering the last story dealt with the sun turning black, thinking this was some sort of time travel or something, just for a brief second. But then you realize it's just him looking back at the moment that led to him chasing clearly that he walked in on her making out with someone else and it set him off on this path. But it also takes a step back and you see that you know, he he has this, this thought in his head of thinking this is kind of something that was long due because he actually started dating her and fooling around with her when she was dating his friend. In a way, things are now kind of coming full circle. And then he runs into that friend again and they have this interesting conversation. And again, coming into the idea of 
chaos and do things happen for a reason, especially in the way that this ends. And uh, again, it gets gets rather dark rather quickly. That's something that's very common for the first two stories. You know, they kind of start off and you think, you know, they're progressing a certain way, but they get, especially for the second story, kind of sad in, in a way, almost bittersweet uh, in the sense of like he reconciles with his friend, but then by the end of it, things go a, a bit sour. And the last story, why it's really notable is because it's the first story that I've read from him where he's actually writing in the perspective of a woman. You know, this is, you know, the woman is the main character so far. It's all been kind of guys and it's wondering like, how much does he change his writing style when he's writing a female, writing through a female perspective versus a male perspective? And I would think not to a great extent. Again, it's another relationship drama uh, situation where she's just trying to kind of find herself in life. And that really asks the question about relationships in general. You see with that, if there's anything different, is that she's much more perceptive about what people want from her in society or what society expects from individuals, especially when it comes to relationships. Because she looks at her mother and her grandmother, who at that moment of time are, are living alone, asking questions of like, these relationships that I'm in that seem to be broken, Am I in them just because I'm supposed to be in them? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that the way I'm supposed to be happy? Or can I be content not doing that? And struggling with that question as well. So again, questions are the key so far. Asking those questions, trying to figure things out, but not necessarily always having the exact answers, which I do think is kind of common for both any movies and comics, kind of having those open-ended discussions of like, you know, what is the answer and not always having the answer to it. And that sometimes can be not the most satisfying way to experience something because you want things to kind of wrap up and like have a point to them. But sometimes the point is that there is no point or sometimes the point is that things, life is just chaos and things just happen for a reason or maybe you will be happy not being with someone else. So I, I did think I liked the at, at the seams a lot more than in Accidental Death. I think, again, artistically, at an actual end of death is a step, step and above when it comes to at the seams. But story wise, I felt like he was a little bit more comfortable here. Plus, you got more. I mean, you have three stories here, three short stories, which were, again, effectively told. Um, and if there's anything that I have an issue when it comes to cartooning is that I feel like he has like five different faces he uses and he can continue to use those similar faces. It's like a lot of the characters in this like look exactly like the characters from um, the, the Love Life comics where you're wondering, like, are these the same people? There's not that, that much variation. It seems like he does not have a, a lot of uh, different ways of depicting people on the page, at least with these first two comics. Again, eventually, Edward Baker starts becoming an artist, and I can kind of see why. Like, I think, it's, like I said, his art is pretty good. It does the job, but it's, it's not his strength when it comes to storytelling. It's clearly his ability to write on the page. I do think, though, in this issue, like he trusts the, his art a lot more than he did in Low Life, especially when it came to the opening of that second story, uh, letting art tell the story, letting kind of the that T sequence, especially when it came to that scene of him looking at his girlfriend making out with someone else. Like I felt like that story beforehand, he would have written more on the page to kind of spell things out a bit more. Here he trusted himself a bit more because you're seeing evolution already when it comes to his storytelling. And even looking back at accidental death, I think he probably also trusted the artist a bit more. Again, it's an entirely different way of doing comics when you're collaborating with someone else, just from your scripting standpoint, like how much, how much does that change? Fortunately, you know, there's no back matter here because Edward Baker is real known for kind of having essays in the back when he kind of explain, explains his process. Clearly, this is way too early in his career to do that. But I was really happy to go back and check out these books again. It's interesting just seeing him progress as a writer, even in like this short period of time, the few years that he did low life to at the seams. You know, I am seeing him, him becoming more confident at his ability as being a storyteller, and especially when he's working with another artist. Next week, we'll be talking about uh, Edward Baker's first work for DC, well, technically Vertigo, and uh, with his one shot on Prez Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is a book that is saturated in the 90s. And then also talking about Scene of the Crime, which is one, his first collaboration with not only Michael Lark, but Sean Phillips, who did inking for that book. And when we talk about it, I'll mention how I think it's one of the most important books of that time, because when you look at it, it really helped establish Edward Baker and his career and everything that moved forward. How good is the book? We'll find out next week. But if you're interested, you want to follow along. The cool thing about both of those books, unlike these, where I had to get them off eBay, those are all available on Comixology. Uh, the, even the Prez book, I think there's actually this random collection of Prez stories that's like $6 that it's included in. You can buy it by itself as well. 
and then scene of the crime if you have comixology unlimited as of right now is free on that but again it's also available on the uh, dc app as well the dc infinite app so if you're interested and want to read those stories we'll be talking about both of those next week anyways that's it for, for me anyways that's it for me for this week let me know what you've been thinking about this ed brubaker retrospective down below have you read the books we'll be talking about next week what are your thoughts on them again are there any books i definitely need to cover when i do this let me know and i'll make sure i try to cover those as fast as i can uh thanks for checking out my channel i know there are a ton of comic book channels out there a ton of youtube channels so any view any comment any like i truly do appreciate just remember that comics are for everyone the key is finding the right one until next time keep reading